Coming up on Stu Does America, Jeff Bezos was trending today because he apparently has too much money. I'll try to climb through all my empty Amazon boxes to tell you why that is stupid. Plus, there's one thing we haven't tried against the coronavirus, and it's been used in almost all of the countries that have had the most success against it. But I'm not sure you're going to like it that much. We'll talk about it with Lyman Stone, plus Sarah Gonzalez and more. There's only one day left to get 30 bucks off at blazetv.com slash stew. Make sure to use the promo code stew because that's how they know you like this stupid show and you'll get 30 bucks off. That's only till tomorrow, so make sure you do it. And you can watch every episode of show uh, of the show for free whenever you want. Just go to YouTube, search for stew, and I'll be the first one there. Click the bell so that you know that when we post new stuff and subscribe and comment and rate and review and all the things. Remember, five stars is the correct number of stars. Thanks for your thousands of five-star reviews on iTunes. It makes a big difference with my ego. Jeff Bezos was trending on Twitter today. Why? Let's ask New Jersey Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman, shall we? And, and, you know, before you say it, yes, it's the same New Jersey Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman that had her two sons sentenced to seven years in prison for robbing a Kids R Us at gunpoint. OK, but I don't honestly see how that has anything to do with this story whatsoever. And yes, she's the same New Jersey representative, Bonnie Watson Coleman, that then later sponsored a bill that would prevent businesses from running criminal background checks on people applying for jobs. And yes, she's the same New Jersey representative, Bonnie Watson Coleman, that had one of her two sons get hired by the county that she represents right after she got elected to Congress. So what? Why do you bring it up? Racism? Hmm? And anyway, New Jersey Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman's son now has a mom that's a congresswoman and Kids R Us is out of business. So who won? You tell me. Oh, and by the way, Kids R Us, maybe you could have, I don't know, stayed in business or been robbed at gunpoint less often if the R on your sign wasn't backwards. Or maybe just maybe if your company was run by something other than a giraffe. It's a stupid hire. Besides the fact that Almost all giraffes have no formal education, which, you know, was proven by the whole backwards R thing anyway. They can't fit into the doors of the stores they're supposed to be running. Think it through, you morons. Anyway, here's a tweet from New Jersey Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman. She says, Jeff Bezos is expected to become the first trillionaire as he consolidates the retail market during coronavirus. Now Amazon is telling its workers who have faced significant risk that it'll be ending their hazard pay at the end of May. Atrocious greed. Oh, so no wonder Jeff Bezos is trending. He's expected to be the first trillionaire, and he's cutting pay. What a bastard. The sentiment was repeated by many, you know, other randos on Twitter who, uh, whose children did not commit armed robbery at kids' clothing stores. Jeff Bezos is about to become the world's first trillionaire while we're about to enter a depression. And there's this one. Jeff Bezos makes $2,489 per second. Meanwhile, millions of people are currently unemployed. By the way, that tweet was sent along with a screen grab from last year's best picture, uh, Parasite. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that this anonymous tweeter hasn't actually made it to the end of the movie. To be fair, though, that's a lot of uh, South Korean subtitles to read. And that's, you know, it's just hard. It's hard to do it. If you're still curious, though, the movie can be rented or purchased online through Amazon Prime Video. The website Common Dreams was also very upset at Bezos as well. Slap in the face as Bezos' wealth jumps 30 billion amid, amid the pandemic. Amazon to end $2 per hour hazard pay for workers. By the way, don't make the mistake of Common Dreams. Never assume your dreams are common. This is a lesson we learned clearly in the 1985 documentary, Real Genius. Chris. Morning. You know, um, 
Something strange happened to me this morning. Was it a dream where you see yourself standing in sort of sun god robes on a pyramid with a thousand naked women screaming and throwing little pickles at you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Why am I the only person that has that dream? It happens. If you haven't seen this award-winning documentary, you can check it out on Amazon Prime Video. It's an understandable instinct to be pissed off at Jeff Bezos for being a trillionaire while so many people are suffering. But it is also a bad instinct. When you want bad things to happen to another person because you don't like seeing them happy when you're comparably sad, that's something to be embarrassed about, not something to tweet about. Sure, greed is one of the seven deadly sins, but so is envy. We used to be critical of people who wanted to keep up with the Joneses. Who knew that all you had to do was rebrand it as income inequality and you could make it the Democratic Party platform? Honestly, I was kind of hoping Bernie Sanders would be the first trillionaire. Uh, he had to change his uh, stump speech from blaming millionaires and billionaires because he became a millionaire himself. Now it's just billionaires. But I kind of just want to see him squirm as he tries to blame all of the world's problems on quadrillionaires. So what is Jeff Bezos supposed to do exactly here? I don't know. I mean, he could give away his trillion dollars, I guess. But what good would that even do? The government has already spent three trillion dollars, plus more on the way, plus trillions more from the Fed. And what has that done? Just because you know his name, Jeff Bezos can't fix all your problems. I'm sorry. The best charity that Jeff Bezos can run right now is something called Amazon. When millions of people are being laid off, Amazon has been hiring at an incredible pace. They're hiring 175,000 people, which is more than anyone except for Walmart, another company that gets crap from the same income inequality brigade. For comparison's sake, Kids R Us is currently hiring zero employees. But as Twitter kind of furiously pointed out this morning, Bezos is cutting the pay of those workers, all while he's becoming a trillionaire. More on that in a second. Is he actually cutting their pay though? Well, in a job market where, let's just say demand is outpacing supply, Amazon instituted a $2 per hour hazard pay raise for their frontline workers, plus they doubled the overtime rate. This started in mid-March as the scale of the pandemic was first being recognized. It was supposed to run until the end of April. Amazon then extended it until the middle of May. Then they extended it again until the end of May. We live in a world in where a raise that gets extended twice counts as a pay cut. Amazing. Of course, there will always be complaints that some evil giant company is putting the little guy out of business. But Amazon is keeping thousands of little guys in business. Tons of them making the majority of their income selling through Amazon. And beyond this, can we just stop and acknowledge the obvious here for a second? We'd all be dead right now if it wasn't for Amazon. Every one of us. Literally, this website is the difference between us and Mad Max Fury Road, which, by the way, is available now on Amazon Prime Video. The past couple of months have sucked beyond what any of us could possibly have conceived before this. But can you imagine what this would have been like without Amazon? This company is a miracle, and I mean that sincerely. Quite frankly, I am glad Jeff Bezos is going to be a trillionaire. More on that in a second. Good. Good for him. Whatever. He's made all of our lives a lot easier. He deserves it. He should be thanking, uh, thanking his lucky stars that he's able to put this uh, company together. It doesn't, it doesn't happen for everybody, but we should be thanking the Amazons of the world for not trashing them on Twitter all the time. That's all we're doing. But there was no shortage of trashing on Twitter going on all day long. Maybe Trump was right when he called Jeff Bezos Jeff Bozo. <laughs> These nicknames. The world's first trillionaire? Trillionaires shouldn't effing exist. It doesn't even sound right. People are dying of hunger. It would take $7 billion a year to reduce malnutrition worldwide. He does make a point there. Trillionaires shouldn't exist. Here's the good news. They don't. The stupidity of the trending Bezos thing. Bezos is going to be a trillionaire. The stupidity of it is difficult to overestimate. It's based on a, air quotes, study from a small business advice platform called Comparison. Notice how they spell comparison with an S-U-N, which is not how you spell it. I wonder if Jeffrey the giraffe got a new upper management job. Of course, the study does not 
say he is a trillionaire or that he's going to be a trillionaire because of the pandemic. In fact, it came out long before the pandemic. And all it does is take the Forbes number for his personal wealth and quoting the study, we then calculated the average yearly percentage growth and that's how they wrote it with the percentage sign. They didn't spell the word out. The average yearly percentage growth over the last five years and apply this rate of growth for each future year to try to predict how the value will change. Wow, my mind is spinning. Do I need an advanced economics degree to understand this study? Very difficult. The truth is, Bezos is nowhere close to a trillion dollars. Now, yes, I'll give you, he's closer than me and everyone else, but he's not close Amazon has had an increase in sales, obviously, because we're all home and getting everything delivered. But their sales are up about 25% so far. Amazon stock fell at the beginning of the pandemic, but has rebounded and is now up 9% since February. I mean, that's pretty good. And, you know, it's taken its personal wealth from $125 billion to $143 billion, according to Forbes. Now, I don't think he's on the verge of robbing a Kids R Us at gunpoint or anything. But he's also not remotely close to a trillionaire. And even if he was, why would you care? Jeff Bezos doesn't have your money. Jeff Bezos has his money. This is tough for the left to understand, but his money is not your money. Just because you want it doesn't mean you can have it. Jeff Bezos didn't have anything to do with you losing your job because of a once in a century pandemic. He wasn't purchasing pangolins in a Wuhan wet market, though he might be able to ship you one if you're a prime subscriber. Who does America? You might not think you're worth the best beans from all around the world in your coffee. Delivered right to your door. But you know what? I do. I believe in you. Uh, you know, look, cut corners with other stuff, like uh, kids' college funds. Pfft, whatever. Get the best coffee delivered to you now. Now is not the time to settle for some crappy grocery store brand. Conveniently, you're barely allowed to go out and enter a grocery store anyway. So get it all delivered from Black Rifle Coffee Company. Veteran-owned and operated premium small batch roast-to-order coffee company importing only the highest quality beans from around the world. Plus, they're just great guys. They love America. They're, they're veterans. They do this the right way. And they always roast their coffees to order. The best way to get uh, Black Rifle Coffee is with the Black Rifle Coffee Club. Choose the amount that you want and the blends that you want, and Black Rifle will uh, discount the price for you, which is great. And then they ship it directly to your home or your office when you do go back completely free. BlackRifleCoffee.com slash stew. They've got the little, they've got the grounds, they got the beans, they've got the little roundy things that you put in the little machine thing there, whatever those things are called. They got everything at BlackRifleCoffee.com slash stew. Make sure to enter the discount code stew because that's how they know you like this stupid show and you'll get 20% off your first order of any coffee product. It's BlackRifleCoffee.com slash stew. As the effects of the pandemic continue, we're all looking desperately for a way out of this. Our next guest says he has one. Uh, it's been proven effective. Lyman Stone is an economist based in, uh, with the American Enterprise Institute, and he joins us from Hong Kong. Lyman, our, our approach so far has been a shutdown for pretty much everyone, and we're now starting to open things up. If someone does get sick, we tell them to isolate at home. But you've looked at this and you've looked around the world, including your home of Hong Kong, and seen that there's a much more efficient solution to this. Absolutely. We're essentially locking down all of society when what we really need to do is we just need to put people who are infectious uh, into controlled quarantine sites to protect wider society in a much less disruptive way. This strategy works better. It's time tested. It's, uh, it's the standard that anyone would use if we weren't kind of distracted by the appeal of super preci precision testing programs that, uh, that are theoretically possible nowadays. Um, and, and it would work if applied today, and it has worked in countries that have done it. The U.S. just hasn't. Yeah, it's interesting. I, it, you know, the idea of 
of uh, centralized quarantine, I think, does freak people out a little bit, um, although it's been around for a while, as you point out. <laughs> um, it does. It does. Um, so can you kind of walk me through? Let's let's start with like 101, centralized quarantine 101 here. Um, how, you go into quarantine. Who goes into quarantine? How long do they stay there? Where do they go? Right. Those are great questions because people hear centralized quarantine and they do freak out a little bit. <laughs> it, it sounds like we're talking about internment camps or something, mm -hmm. and, and we're not. So who goes into quarantine? It's simple. It's people who test positive for COVID or their close contacts. So when somebody gets a positive test, the next step is that we have someone interview them and basically ask, who are your close contacts? Who have you had contact with in the last few days? We then go to those people uh, and we confirm, did they actually have close contact or uh, is, is, that, is there any truth to that? Uh, and if they were close contacts, uh, then they go into a quarantine center as well. Uh, each household is kept separate. Um, we could give household members the option to be separated from each other. Um, but there's no reason that we would need to like separate parents and children uh, intentionally. If they want to be separated for each other's protection, we, we could obviously provide that. Um, but especially given that COVID is very low risk to children, it's perfectly fine to quarantine parents and their children together. Um, we don't, there's no need to separate families to, right. to do this safely. Um, so uh, that's who goes in, is simply people with a positive test or their close contacts. Um, so then the question is, where do they go? Again, a lot of people have this image of like tent camps out in the desert or something, but that's, that's not accurate at all. Uh, the U.S. has 5 million hotel rooms and most of them are vacant right now. If we assume that an average of one, one and a half, two people per hotel room, we're talking at least 5 million people that we can have quarantined at a time there. If you also add in, um, hospital wards that can be used for severe cases uh, and uh, in extreme need, something like uh, converted school classrooms, um, you, can, you can get another million or two million. Um, and so simply what we would do is we would put people in hotel rooms. Ideally, we would pay them for the trouble of their lost time. We'd provide them food free of charge. We'd provide them um, regular symptom checking. And if they develop severe cases, uh, we'd move them out of a hotel uh, into a hospital. And we do so at an earlier stage of the, of the disease than would be likely if they were quarantined at home um, and with more careful monitoring of the progress of the disease. The result of all this, um, the objective of all of this, uh, is that instead of having someone infectious be at home where they are likely to um, have household members continue to go out on errands for them, where they might receive visitors, um, and where they might themselves go out, um, uh, and where they might inadvertently infect family members, is that we give people an option to protect their family. Of course, we're not going to force people to be separated from their family, but we give them the option if they want to uh, protect their family that way. Um, and I think most people would take that option. I know I would if it were mm -hmm. between that and infecting my, my wife or my child. Um, and, uh, um, and we also guarantee that, that they're not going to be infecting others outside of their household. A recent study, um, Israel has a quarantine pro has a, a centralized quarantine program and a home quarantine program. They have both. And they tracked the cell phones of people in the home quarantine program. And they found that solidly 15% of people in the home quarantine program, even though they were being digitally monitored, even though the program was being enforced essentially by the military, <laughs> still 15% of COVID positive people left their house Wow! while ordered to be at home. And that's not including their household members who may have left the house or visitors they may have received. Home quarantine is extremely porous. Probably almost as much as half of home quarantine cases have some kind of leakage. That keeps the spread going. Mm -hmm. That's why in places with lockdowns, you see, you see the spread is only very slowly declining. 
Uh, it's, so it's interesting because we're seeing this with the uh, this is the, why we want centralized the the mobility data that we're seeing here in the United States is showing that right. I mean, even at the peak of of people um, in uh, home isolation, it's only cutting to about forty percent of people who are actually isolating. Um, so that, that that does seem to be proven out. Um, right. So I guess like let me let me get a, a couple more quick ones on just the basic of how this would work because it's 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 very interesting. Um, one uh, if it, it, how does this free up the rest of society? Why is it advantageous in that way? And two, right. um, uh, how can we guarantee that we don't plop all these people in central cor- centralized quarantine, a bunch of sick people and a bunch of not sick people, and then they just pass it to each other? I've seen our record with nursing homes. We're not very good at this right now. Uh, how do you make sure that that doesn't happen? Right. Uh so let me take that question first. Uh, the case of nursing homes is 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 a tragedy, um, and it's a preventable one. Um, but it's driven by the specific dynamics of how a nursing home works. You have people who need close personal care mm-hmm. in a nursing. If you're in a nursing home, if you're a patient in a nursing home or a resident in a nursing home, then someone needs to help you. That's why you're there. They might need to help you with mobility. They might need to help you with care. They might need to help you eat, which means you have very close personal contact with that person. Mm-hmm. In, in virtually every society, nursing home staff have been allowed to continue circulating freely. The rational response from an early period would have been isolate nursing home staff rent out a couple hotels and make sure that all the nursing home staff are completely isolated there Mm -hmm. um, and that they they don't go home. Now, this would have been almost impossible to implement because it would require isolating nursing home staff from from their families. But what we needed to do was throw up barbed wire around nursing homes to protect them Mm -hmm. um, because of the dangers of this disease, particularly that group. Centralized quarantine is a different population. This will overwhelmingly be healthy, prime-age people. The vast majority of these cases are likely to either not have the disease at all um, and simply be close contacts who are at risk of getting it but didn't really, or asymptomatic. Now, if people don't have this disease, they'll be out of quarantine in a couple days. They'll come in, we'll give them a test, they'll test negative two subsequent times, they'll go home. Mm -hmm. They'll be there three days, in and out, boom, done. If people have a positive test, they'll remain there until they have until they test negative or 21 days, no matter or 21 days. If we don't have enough tests, enough for the disease to run its course in the vast majority of cases, um, these people aren't. They don't need the same kind of assisted care. If they do need assisted care, instead we would use hospitals, or we might allow people to remain at home if we can't provide them a safe environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but these are groups of people that the only interaction they need to have with uh, with potential transmission vectors, that is people going room to room in a hotel, is a person will knock on their door, drop a bag of food, walk away. Mm-hmm. We can digitally monitor their symptoms. That is, we can ask them every six or eight hours, uh, take your temperature, or take your, your pulse ox, um, and, and uh, provide a picture or video of that. Um, we don't need to have that intensive personal care. So there's not the same risk of transmission. At the same time, uh, it will be important for CDC and state health agencies to work out exact safe protocols to manage quarantine sites and produce uh, essentially a field manual. We need that to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't just want these places being run um, uh, arbitrarily. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I think um, it, one of the things that's maybe appealing, because I feel like there are political hurdles here, and there is that sort of like freak out ability here that I think would be a factor if, if, they, if they tried to do this, and it's probably why they're not trying to do it. But taking, it's taking a step away from that for a second, this gets bad enough. If the, we were to have a second wave that it was really bad, the thing that I think is appealing about your, this plan is that it is... Perhaps, let's say, you know, you're, you're coming down your close contact. 
you probably would prefer to stay mm -hmm. home and have a little freedom. Maybe you're going out to the store or whatever. You, you might like that personally a little bit better. But mm -hmm. it does. It is much less disruptive to society in general. Right. That's the that's the upside of this in that, like, right. you're not shutting down restaurants. You're not shutting right. down everything. You are keeping things open. It's just the people who are in a close contact with someone who is positive. Those people go away for you know a few days, maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, but then they come back and they're able to go uh, mm -hmm. through normal society. Am I understanding exactly. that right? That's that's essentially right. Um, depending on how extensive, a more extensive quarantine program allows the rest of society to get more normal. If it's a very mm -hmm. small quarantine program, the rest of the society can't have as much of a return to normal. Right. But at the extreme upper limit, if you can quarantine 60 or 70 percent of infectious people in the first few days after infection, um, you really you don't need almost any other social distancing. Mm. Um, that on its own is basically enough. Um, if you also have masks and a few other things, you probably only need to quarantine 20, 30, 40 percent of infectious people. Hmm. You go into a lot of detail on this. You have a story uh, with the dispatch. What if we tried a real quarantine, which is great. And it goes through all the history and how this has been in the United States as well. It's really interesting. Can, can you give me I've got about 30 seconds left. Can you give me a, a, a picture of how many countries are using this and has it been successful pretty much everywhere it's been tried? Uh it's difficult to say exactly how many are using it. Lots of countries are experimenting with it. Denmark just rolled out a program. Israel's been doing it for a while. Uh, Hong Kong, South Korea both do this. Um, Taiwan does this, although they've had very few cases. Um, New York is rolling out a program. Montana is rolling out a program. Mm. Wisconsin is rolling out a program. Um, quite a few U.S. states are, are beginning centralized quarantine programs, though they're all, I think, too small, and I don't think any of them are actually paying people yet, and they need to actually start paying people to, to compensate them for the time. Um, but, uh, but lots of places are experimenting with this, um, but the, the canonical cases we've seen have been um, places like Hong Kong and South Korea, and to some extent Israel. Greece and Italy have also experimented with small programs, but it, those programs came very late, in, yeah. in, particularly in Italy's epidemic, so it didn't do much good. Yeah, we definitely found that timing is a big factor when it comes to this. Lyman Stone, American <laughs> Enterprise Institute, uh, thanks so much for coming on the program. The story is in the dispatch. It's called, uh, have we tr uh, What If We Tried a Real Quarantine? It's really, really worth a read to get, get your hands around something that has not been talked about nearly enough. Uh, as we've gone through this. Lyman, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. All right, back in a second. So the stars of Mr. Show with Bob and David, uh, it was an HBO sketch comedy show, one of the greatest shows of all time, honestly. Um, they did a charity fundraiser for coronavirus stuff, and, you know, it's Bob Odenkirk and David Cross. Uh, they did a, um, if you remember this thing that went viral, we talked about it a lot on our show, uh, where these celebrities, in the most condescending way possible from their mansions, all sang Imagine into the camera. And we, uh, we did a monologue on that. And, uh, it's, uh, it's just insane. you got to go back and watch that one if you want. However, uh, they decided to have their little spin on that here during their charity special. How come you're always such a fussy young man? Don't want no Cap'n Crunch, don't want no Raisin Bran. Well, you don't know that other kids are starving in Japan. So eat it. Just eat it. Don't want to argue, I don't want to debate. Don't want to hear about the kind of foods you hate. You won't get no dessert till you clean up your plate. So eat it. I don't care if you're full, just eat it. Eat it. Get yourself an egg. And, and beat it. Have some more chicken. <laughs> have some more so. pie. Have some more chicken. Have some more pie. Have some more chicken. Have some more pie. It doesn't matter if it's boiled or fried. Uh, what are the most just things that's ever happened? Just. Just uh, one of the most you're just things that's always... ever occurred is uh, Bob Odenkirk finding real success later in his career. I'm very excited about that. Um, they did finish it off, though, with a special guest. Just eat it. We're all in this together. 
<laughs> and the we're all in this together. <laughs> Beautiful uh, view from the Hollywood Hills because they're all in it together. We're all in the same picture here. Everyone's got the same situation going on. Sure, 8,500 square feet in the Hollywood Hills, but yours is pretty much the same as that, I'm sure. Uh, that was a really solid job by them. Um, I also like this from a German cafe. This is this is being passed around today. A, a cafe is actually forcing uh, people who go to it to have pool noodles on their head. Because if you're wearing a pool noodle on your head, you kind of are automatically going to have to social distance. Uh, <laughs> you, are you going to bump into somebody else's pool noodle? Um, I, I don't know if that's going to catch on here. Though I will say it's it's... It could be at least kind of a fun way to do it. I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't mind having a meal. I'd rather have a meal with a pool noodle on my head than with a mask on. Now, I'm going to say that that's a, that's a, that's a better, better overall policy. Uh, we'll back in a second. Sarah Gonzalez is the host of the News and Why It Matters on Blaze TV. Did you know that? She's also the host, the owner purveyor of Sarah Gonzalez Unfiltered on YouTube. You should check that out and subscribe there. Plus, she's the mother of an upcoming clump of cells. I am. Uh, congratulations on that. Also known as a parasite, I hear. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> not, ve not really a clump of cells, mm -hmm. uh, as it turns out, according to uh, the ultrasound pictures. So it's much worse, apparently. Yeah. Oh, That's terrible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got to pay for them till they turn 18. Yes. It's way worse than a parasite. Look, we're already, you know, several years into this with other children, and yeah. this is true. There's yeah. some there's some evidence that we'll get to that at another time. <laughs> um, I want to uh, I want to run something by you. This is a uh, in the long series of media being terrible in every single way. Um, let me bring you back in time here a few days to Chuck Todd and his segment where he plays a bar out of context and edits it. Let's watch real quick. I want you to listen to this Bill Barr answer to a question about what will history say about this. Wait till you hear this answer. Take a listen. When history looks back on this decision, how do you think it will be written? Well, history is written by the winner, so it largely depends on... on <laughs> Uh, who's writing the history. I was struck, Peggy, by the cynicism of the answer. It's a correct answer, but he's the attorney general. He didn't make the case that he was upholding the rule of law. He was almost admitting that, yeah, this is a, this is a political job. All right. I, it's really bad, and, and that's the first time I'd actually seen it. I'd heard it a bunch of times. You could see his mouth moving. They actually silenced the video at that oh, yes. point. Yeah. So this leads, right, to, I know you talked about this on the News & Why as well. This leads to the apology from Chuck Todd. Let me give you a little bit of that. I wanted to talk for a moment about something that occurred on Sunday's edition of Meet the Press. During the program, we had a soundbite from a CBS News interview with the Attorney General, Bill Barr. In the bite that we aired and commented on, Mr. Barr was asked how he thinks the history of his decision to end the prosecution of the former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn will be written. Mr. Barr answered, quote, history is written by the winner, so it largely depends on who's writing the history. In the full version of the interview and transcript, he went on to say, but I think a fair history would say that it was a good decision because it held, upheld the rule of law. Now, we did not edit that out. That was not our edit. We didn't include it because we only saw the shorter of two clips that CBS did air. We should have looked at both and checked for a full transcript. A mistake that I wish we hadn't made and one that I wish I hadn't made. The second part of the Attorney General's answer would have put it in the proper context. And had I seen that part of the interview, I would not have framed the conversation the way I did. And I obviously am very sorry for that mistake. We strive to do better going forward. <laughs> okay. Ugh. Now, I give him some credit, I guess, for at least coming I'm, out. And I'm apologize. shocked he even apologized. Right. I kind of was, yeah. too. Actually, I kind of thought this would be the typical thing. They just kind of let it go by the wayside. Um, tell me, does does NBC normally just get their clips from CBS? They don't preview them. They just take them from what the website. How does this work? Because my, my 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 thought would be that NBC News would be as a news department looking at these clips and trying to get the proper context. I mean, you would think that I, last I checked, they're bloated enough that they have the staff to be able to cover <laughs> something like that at the very least. Yeah. That, that's what I thought that, that a lot of people's jobs were entirely. Right. Um, I, you know, I, I actually, I have a friend who works for MSNBC and they actually told me about the giant staff of producers that these people have, including Chuck Todd. So mm. the idea that none of these producers would take the time to look through this entire clip. 
I mean, I'm firing some people if I'm giving that apology. Yeah, honestly, it's pretty bad. Uh, some somebody should have said, look, you know, we got to watch the whole clip. Right. And if they knew about it and, and really did edit it that way, that's, that's horrific because, you know, that's the whole point of him bringing it up. And to your point, too, uh, you know, we, we worked at CNN headline news and the, the uh, I mean, and that was less than CNN with right. the staff size. From CNN headline news to Fox was a massive drop off in size. And from Fox to here is like, <laughs> we actually don't have anybody. We're just doing here. all the work ourselves robots, here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I want to, sh- I, I, I got to get your take on this though. So think of this for a minute. This big thing happens big enough that Chuck Todd has to make a national apology, right? For this. Then the paper of record, the New York Times and their podcast, The Daily, decides they're going to ca- talk about this topic. I'm listening to this this morning. It blows my mind. Listen to this clip. And it was nothing inconsistent with the Obama administration's policies. And it was in U.S. interest. He was saying to the Russians, you know, don't escalate. He actually says that the phone calls were laudable and that it was perfectly understandable that Flynn would talk to the Russian ambassador to try to lower tensions in a very tense environment. When history looks back on this decision, how do you think it will be written? Well, history is written by the winner, so it largely depends on on, (laughs) uh, who's writing the history. I mean, what's fascinating about what Barr is doing is that it does not feel like every day when the Department of Justice sides with a defendant in a criminal prosecution over its own prosecutors who have successfully <laughs> gone after that defendant. I mean, and it, I left it. I left a lot of context in there to prove oh, that they didn't go back and finish the clip. <laughs> but like they did the exact same edit that Chuck Todd had to apologize for like three days afterward. (laughs) How does this happen? There's just, there's no honesty, but nobody's holding them accountable. Yeah. That's, that's the problem. I mean, I'm shocked that Chuck Todd, we got an apology out of Chuck Todd, as Mm -hmm. we discussed previously. uh, And I, I do give a lot of credit to social media for that, because if we didn't have social media, they wouldn't get all of these tweets. There wouldn't be anything trending, proving that people are manipulating the news. But for you know, the most part, generally speaking, there there's no accountability, and they know it, and that's why they do this. I mean, this is the most intellectually dishonest thing yeah. that I've heard. And the sad part is, I can only say that I've heard it this week. Right, I was going to say they're so bad. You have to put an asterisk by that for right. the Cuomo brothers. Uh, right. Anything that they've said is obviously worse than right. that. But this is really bad. I mean, the Cuomo thing is is an interesting part of this because I think. There was a time where the Chuck Todd response was the more normal response. Like they would make a mistake and they'd feel the need to at least address it, even if it was a BS apology. Yeah. You look at Chris Cuomo with his fake coming out of the basement tapes and breaking quarantine, never you know addressing. They never it in held. Yeah, way. they never held him accountable for that, right? No, there's nothing. And so I, I feel like we've crossed a line here where it's no longer this like we're journalists, we promise, and every once in a while we make a mistake and we're sorry about that. They've just crossed the line to pure out, pure out advocacy in many of these organizations. Yeah, and yet they will complain if President Trump dares, you know, not include one of their journalists. Some of the other mm-hmm. ones, but not one of their journalists in one of the, the White House media briefings. They start telling us that he's, you know, attacking the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, because they're not included. Yet they go out, and when they are included, and when they do have, you know, the chance to show that they have the integrity to give the full story, they choose not to do it. Yeah, they really don't. I, I don't think they care. No, I, I don't think they care. I, I, I think they've, they've learned that if they just ignore it, they control enough of the messaging still to this day that they can just get away with it. Um, let me switch over to Jeff Bezos. I talked about this at the beginning of the show today. I'm fascinated by this because we are going through a really difficult time uh, as, a, as the American people here. And I think 95 percent of the country would be dead without Amazon. Um, that's my, uh, everyone in the audience, we'd all be dead because nothing will get delivered and we'd all die. That's just a guess. I mean, that's a percentage. I don't have a scientific study to back that up, but like, here's a time where here's a, a company that has really stepped up in an impossible time. And like, look, nothing's going to be perfect, but 
they've made a real difference. Can you imagine this happening in 1990? No. What this would have been like for, for the American people? It would have been different. We don't appreciate these things. No, we don't appreciate them. And we certainly don't appreciate the fact that they even made the decision to prioritize essential items for people right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they are telling me now somehow they still managed to get my package to me in like less than 48 hours. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. But they at least warn me we may not be able to get your package to you in the you know normal amount of time because we're prioritizing these essential items items for, for all of these people. I mean, like, the guy gets no credit for what he's invented. We, do you know why he's so rich? Because we're all benefiting from what he created. Mm -hmm. And a, a typical Americans, yeah. right, we're so entitled that we just, we overlook the fact that we're benefiting from his creation and we just want to demonize the guy. Yeah, and, and like, I, he, his politics are probably ugly for what we would like, you yeah. know? He's, he's I, you know, he's, he's certainly far from perfect as a person. But, like, he's invented something of real value. Um, and they do things that are amazing. I mean, think of just, just the streaming service. Yeah. Right? Like, how much have people taken advantage of that here? And I think this all goes back to something that we were talking about a lot before this whole COVID thing happened, which is like, this sort of rise of that far extreme left within the Democratic Party, that sort of Bernie AOC wing that sees any, anything that's good for someone who's a business owner as bad for everyone else. Um, and they, they, you know, famously, AOC got Amazon pushed out of New York City. So thousands and thousands of jobs were lost. Mm -hmm. And she looked at that as a big win. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they are all determined to create this class warfare system yeah. where we're all supposed to hate the millionaires, the job creators, the people who are bringing us our packages in, you know, a day or two. <laughs> and I, I just think that it's awful because the people who really lose in this are not just us, but also the people who are complaining about the millionaires, the billionaires, yeah. the quote trillionaires. They're losing out, too, because if you eliminate these people, you're eliminating companies like Amazon. You're eliminating all of these inventions that are helping all of us out. And it's just sad that they don't realize that when they go into these class warfare modes. They don't understand that they're actually eliminating benefits for themselves. Yeah, no, it's true. And I, I wonder, at least at some level uh, with that group, right, the AOCs, and AOC doesn't really, I don't think she has any deeper plans. She's, She's just a puppet, yeah, she, mouthpiece. Yeah, exactly. But there is that, there is an element there where you're taking one of the only companies who's able to give people jobs right now. You know, I mean, everything, the economy blows. 36 million people are out of work. They're hiring 175,000 people. They're giving them raises. Um, and then they get in trouble for the raise going away after after the, the, the uh, hazard pay goes away. Um, it's almost like you... You want to find everything that you can vilify within this system because you want the system to die. These aren't even coherent arguments at times. No, I, I like to equate it to the, uh, the book that we read our children called If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. I believe that that's what all of these class warfare socialists, uh, you know, yeah. they strive to be, that if you give him a cookie, he's going to need a glass of milk. He's going to then need a napkin. He's not going to appreciate any of it. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you just you, you don't want to give the mouse the cookie. You don't want to give these entitled Americans too much because <laughs> they never expect you to take it away. All they expect is more, 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 because if you can give me this raise, well, certainly that means that you can give me more. Yeah. And that's the way that they think about it. It now. is. And, you know, we look at this guy because he's got a bunch of commas after his net worth. Who cares? Right. That has never affected me good at all. Him. And good for him. Like, he can have as much money as he, as he can make. I mean, that's great. Um, but at no other time in our history would this have been, I mean, it was horrible, and it's been horrible, but it, it couldn't have been, um, it would have been worse at any other time in our history because of these advancements, because of what capitalism has built. Mm -hmm. And they can't, they can't handle that. They yeah. can't handle it. I don't even think that, I mean, I don't think they can handle it, but I think there's also an element of there. We are just so entitled these days. There's just, we have had it good for so long yeah. that there are a lot of people who don't know what it's like to be on the other side of that. And they just have absolutely no perspective, except I'm a rich American and this is my first world problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we're at now. This is the way it works. Sarah Gonzalez, News and Why It Matters, of course, and uh, also Unfiltered. Sarah Gonzalez Unfiltered on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to that. And also, you can subscribe to see all of our shows here at blazetv.com slash stew. If you use the promo code stew, you should do that because that's how they know you like this stupid show. And I'll save 30 bucks, but only until tomorrow. So don't screw it up. You can use that 30 bucks to give it directly to Jeff Bezos. Sarah, thanks for coming to the program. Thank you. Thanks. Back in a second. This review in on the show on iTunes, Stu does this stupid show. I love this stupid show. It's great. Whatever.
Stu is like my misnamed, in no way related, look nothing alike brother I've never met and don't even like, but I love this stupid show. And you might say, is there an insult in there somewhere? No, because look at the top five freaking stars. The appropriate amount of stars. One more day left on the blazetv.com slash stew offer for 30 bucks off. Use the promo code stew. Do it.